Okay. All right. That's uh, if you if you look up at the top, you see that uh, little thing going up there. That's during the uh, solar eclipse. So this is twenty-five point two uh, kilohertz uh, signal out of North Dakota, and it's received in North Carolina. So I've got about a four by five foot uh, VLF loop. Interestingly enough, it's in my attic, uh, and I've got a metal roof. So I was real surprised that this worked as well as it did. Uh, uh, but anyway, it, I've done a, a number of VLF uh, re receptions uh, with that antenna in the attic, and seems to come up pretty good. But naturally, I, I had my offsets uh, not really set far enough, so it went off scale. So don't you hate that when you've got a you've got something that you can't repeat, non-repeating uh, uh, incident, and it goes off scale. So that sort of makes the data worthless because up in here you don't know what uh, what it actually went to. But it probably wasn't more than a dB above uh, the minus 88. Uh, so this was done with a, a RF space uh, SDR IQ uh, SDR and this uh, uh, loop that I've got that has about 400 feet of wire. Uh, forget how many turns uh, I've got on that. Uh, but anyway, that's uh, that's from yesterday. I'm running it again today to get a, a comparison. Uh, you know, normally there's quite a few flares that show up as as little bumps on the uh, graph, uh, but right now there's not that much uh, flaring going on. So the sun, uh, once it turns the uh, really active side towards us next week, probably uh, this would have been much much more messy. But as it was yesterday, it was very very quiet. Uh, except for this, you know, the, the one incident here caused by the uh, two hours uh, of effect from the eclipse. Any questions on that? Did I cover everything? <laughs> okay. Well, so gonna... like after the eclipse, the baseline is about one dB lower than where it was before the eclipse? Yeah. Uh, anybody want to explain that? I'm not sure how that works, but it's definitely obviously uh, half a dB uh, lower right here than it was before. Can, uh, that, can we see something? I noticed that data was also uh, there in Fabio's, uh, he, yeah. he's one of the professors here at uh, the university. He had the same uh, uh, slight dip after the eclipse than before in his data. Okay, how did he explain it? He didn't know yet either. He's he's <laughs> analyzing it too. <laughs> what was that website again? He was he was, he was laughing, laughing because uh, uh, people, people were asking him right away when the clips step, step and what did he learn? What did he learn from his data immediately? Yeah, <laughs> they were like looking at it and they're like, "What? Well, what is this? What does this mean?" I don't know. I just got it too. I'm sure they tested most of them. Who the me John. Hey Charles, what software are you using? Uh, this is SpectraView. It's SpectraView. Uh, it's RF space. Uh, uh, the ones that made the SDR, their uh, their software. I mean, this is almost a twenty-year-old uh, uh, software package now, but uh, I tend <clears> to use <throat> like test equipment. It, it's so so perfect in terms of the way uh, all the FFT settings, smoothings, uh, you know, and ability to change the scales and things. Uh, it uh, they were way ahead of the curve in terms of learning what people were uh, needing. 
uh, 20 years ago, so they really haven't done a whole lot of updates. Uh, I mean, they've gone to web-based uh, SDRs now that you know you can listen to a receiver in another country if you uh, know the IP address and can log into it uh, with some of the same software. And of course, it does. You can see across the bottom here. It does. Uh, continue. This is continuum uh, mode. So there's. Um, I forget how many hours across here. And so, what was hours. the uh, what was the frequency you were listening to again? Uh, twenty five point two kilohertz. 5.2 kilohertz out of North Dakota. <clears throat> but that's your, and that's the actual RF frequency. That's not the resulting frequency after a transversion or anything. Right. This is VLF. Uh, so we're, I'm looking at the, uh, the actual beacon uh, itself in an 800 uh, hertz uh, bandwidth and then smoothing it a little bit. Uh, and so this is kind of a a fairly calm day. You know, there's not a lot of interference spikes or anything, you know, fortunately. So this was a good, good strong signal. Are you familiar with the VLF group and their when their reflector? Uh, there, there were a lot of guys listening down at VLF like this, and and you can probably get more information from them. Yeah, yeah, I. I I watched a little bit of Whit Reeves uh, talk the other day where he was using the uh, SDR Uno software and an SDR Play, and I have the same equipment, uh, but I wasn't able to figure out how to do what he was doing. I was uh, too late in getting uh, uh, that all set up, so I didn't want to change my uh, background data or whatever, you know, my previous data by trying to do it, but the the uh, SDR Play Duo that I have can take this same antenna directly in high impedance uh, loop. And uh, it, Whit was using it to do, I think, four different beacons at the same time uh, on, on the same uh, you know chart. So that was that was kind of what I was looking at that for, but I never figured out how to get it all working in time for yesterday. I'm going to steal the screen for a second and show yeah, you stop, sure. what, yeah. uh, <clears throat> what we were looking at this morning with uh, Fabiano and his group. That's the SentPi. And so this was at the eclipse right here, and then this is after. And you can see after the eclipse, it just kind of, I guess this is probably about the time totality ended, and then it yeah. just kind of leveled out, and you can kind of see some of these. He sees a little bit of sine wave propagation in there as well. He's not really sure what's going on. Yeah. But it kind of looks the same pattern as kind of what you see at nighttime as well. Or in that transition phase from day to night. Right, the, the time to recover is what he talked about as well. He also isn't quite sure because this could also just be an artifact from their equipment. Yeah, so he wants to, he, you know, he's going he's gonna to do the scientific thing and make sure that his, his data is actually recording accurately and this is a measured phenomenon and not just a, a piece of the equipment. But that's kind of similar to what you saw there, Charles, after... It's lower than than he expected. And it didn't just kind of. I think he expected to see that more continuous, you know, after local noon. 
kind of see that gradual continuous decrease in tonight and it just kind of flattened out and then it kind of recovered and then I guess probably as the sun got lower in the horizon. Another another thing to note, I did a full paper on uh, predicting how the eclipse would affect this. Um, the, uh, the geometry of where the eclipse comes in between the receiver and the transmitter is also important. I think Charles had a very, probably a unique thing where the, uh, the uh, umbra came right between him and this and the transmitting station. So there's almost a, a very, uh, a very uniform curve. Yeah. My guess is that in Texas, you guys got a very odd angle where the, uh, where the shadow went through compared to where the transmitter and receiver was. So well, it's this... not geometrically centered and therefore it'll give you a slight different uh, uh, offset uh on your uh, receiving here so your, your transmitter on this one was a gps satellite and the receiver is right here on the ground right here at oh. uh, ut dallas under the eclipse under the eclipse yeah under totality okay, so, yeah that, that'd give you a different geometry than uh what charles had yeah and wit uh wit talked a lot about long path uh uh also which I didn't fully understand how that would add in and give some of the ripples that uh, cancel and so forth on VLF. So he was talking about a lot about uh, short path and long path uh, signals uh, combining. 